We are 364 members, representing 132 academic institutions, from coast to coast, north to south, from the Big Apple to the Big Easy. Our members work tirelessly to achieve our mission of excellence in research, education, and patient care, joining together to make us the singular voice for academic ophthalmology. The AUPO is at an important juncture. At 50, we are poised to rededicate ourselves to our mission and re-energize for the challenges ahead. On our golden anniversary, let's celebrate our accomplishments and our role in ophthalmic history. In the early 1960s, not many medical schools had separate dedicated departments of ophthalmology. The NIH provided meager eye research funding and lumped ophthalmology in with neurological diseases. But that was all about to change, and a friend of Al Capone's would be the impetus. Jules Stein made his way through medical school by booking nightclub acts in Chicago, where he later set up a private practice in ophthalmology. He gave up eye care and created the Music Corporation of America in 1924. With A-list talent, the company grew into a billion-dollar entertainment behemoth. And while Stein amassed great wealth, he never lost sight of his passion for vision science. In 1960, he established Research to Prevent Blindness, which began dispersing grant money, and that helped incentivize more medical schools to create departments of ophthalmology. Stein tapped David Weeks as executive officer and tasked him with helping push forward the effort to establish a National Eye Institute. Soon after in Chicago, a group of eminent academics were snowed in at O'Hare Airport. There they strategized about how to bring about a separate National Institute that would support vision science and they brainstormed about how to unite their academic colleagues nationwide into an organized, cohesive group for advocacy. Weeks's next move was to commission a Gallup poll to survey Americans' concerns about blindness. The majority of the people in the United States were concerned about the disability of blindness as being the worst thing that could happen to them. And over and above that, it was the second largest concern as far as an affliction under, just behind cancer and way ahead of heart. The public response provided some other interesting findings. A large group uh, felt that uveitis was associated with a female disorder. And uh, there were a fair number of people who thought that retinal detachment had something to do with hemorrhoids. Then a comprehensive survey of the status of eye research in the United States by Dr. Thomas Duane of Jefferson Medical College recommended increased governmental investment and the creation of a National Eye Institute. With momentum building, Weeks headed to Washington with a bill he drafted calling for the NEI. It failed because it never got out of committee. And it didn't get out of committee because even though we'd done a lot of good work to get it started, there was no scientific endorsement of it. We started looking for a, 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 a possibility of finding some organization to do it. A. Edward Bomney of Johns Hopkins had been at the original meeting at O'Hare, and he became one of those leading the call for the chairman of the country's departments of ophthalmology to unite. They created the AUPO and we're ready for the next session of Congress. I testified for the formation of the National Eye Institute, but it never would have come about without the encouragement of the AUPO. President Johnson signed the measure that created the National Eye Institute in 1968. Since then, the NEI and AUPO have worked together to meet problems of eye disease head on. Building on that early landmark success, the AUPO began holding annual meetings to knit together the academic community. I've actually attended 35 of the 50 annual meetings, and I've seen an incredible change in the organization. Started off as a relatively small, clubbish kind of environment, and has grown into a, a very large, very effective organization. Often the informal sessions had as much or even more value than did the always informative uh, regular scheduled sessions. And this occurred at coffee breaks and on the tennis court, walks on the beach, and even happy hour. 
Our membership was a bit limited in the beginning, initially only including chairs of U.S. medical schools. Later, we added residency program directors, Canadian counterparts, research directors, and medical student educators. With many faces and one voice, the AUPO has made an indelible mark on our field. A major innovation came in 1977 when the AUPO voted to introduce a national residency matching program. The advantages of the match program and its central application service are enormous. The resident or fellow can complete a single application that can be distributed to all the programs he wishes to apply to, rather than have him complete an application for each and every program, which is very time consuming. In some ways, the match is so effective that it just seems to put the right program with the right applicant. I think the most significant thing which happened during my term on the board was the establishment of the AUPO RPB Resident and Fellow Research Forum. I suggested introducing academic content into the annual meeting, specifically inviting four to six residents and fellows each year to present their research findings. During my tenure on the board of trustees, from 1998 to 2004, and in conjunction with the AAO, we established the Strassman Award for Excellence in Resident Education. This preeminent award recognizes top residency program directors. So far, we've honored 13. This award carries the name of our esteemed colleague, Dr. Bradley Stratzma, who was the founding director of the Jules Stein Eye Institute. In 2004, the AUPO selected its first woman as president, Dr. Bronwyn Bateman. I don't like breaking champagne glasses, but I do like cracking glass ceilings. Over the last decade, there has been significant growth in the number of women choosing ophthalmology as a career. And thus, there should be ample opportunity to advance them in leadership roles. Our membership offers an unrivaled reservoir of knowledge to tap into. In 2005, we initiated a formal mentoring program for newly appointed chairs. You know, a chair is a lonely position. Mentors are able to provide advice and guidance in a broad range of subjects. My fondest memory is from uh, a breakfast uh, with Ed Norton. He wrote out on a paper napkin what he considered to be guiding principles for a chair. My favorite was in dealing with difficult and disgruntled faculty, simply to say, I respect your opinion in that matter. I just don't have it to agree. That same year, a significant accomplishment was the creation of the Fellowship Compliance Committee. Because why wouldn't you want to have some sort of uniform standards like we have in residency that you have in fellowships? It's that simple. In 2006 and 2012, the AUPO made a major contribution by completing comprehensive salary surveys. These took into consideration academic rank, subspecialty, region of the country, as well as administrative, clinical, and research responsibilities. The AUPO and AAO inaugurated the Excellence in Medical Student Education Award in 2014. Dr. Linda Lippa at UC Irvine was the first recipient Active partnerships and financial support over our five decades have enabled the AUPO to reach its current level of stature and accomplishment. Congratulations, AUPO, on your golden anniversary and best wishes for many, many more years of continued success. The Academy and the AUPO have been partners literally from the very founding of the AUPO. It is a partnership that has become more robust with time serving the profession well, and it will continue to do so for decades to come. Today, I'd really like to recognize the long-standing track record of AUPO in educating the leaders in ophthalmology of tomorrow. And of course, being Scottish, I want to recognize the fact this is an organization without a lot of money, but you get a heck of a lot done. Well done. We have so much to be proud of. Our members have provided training to more than 15,000 ophthalmologists and provided care to millions. You know, the AUPO is a, a lot like marriage. The first 50 years are the hardest. 
Cheers. The next 50 years for the AUPO promises to be extremely exciting. I really look forward to include an official journal for the AUPO to develop additional innovative programming and to work both within the organization and with other organizations inside of ophthalmology and across our profession in order to be part of the chorus of academic medicine. We are AUPO, 50 years and one voice, prepared for the challenges that lie ahead.